for the purposes of anyone who's got this far into our YouTube playlist and hasn't uh, seen yet, um, we are a, a book club run by the uh, for data science uh, community. Um, the the current thing that we're studying is is part of a, a, a few different books that that are studied in the community related to shiny and kind of web development for our developers and this is we're working through javascript for r um we're sort of halfway through the book now um and so this is the second half of chapter 12 for that book uh, and it, it it it's about integrating javascript uh with uh within a shiny application um, and Ryan, who's presented this week, uh, presented the first half of this chapter last week. Uh, okay, so. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I'm going to pick back up. Let me share where I'm at. And we're going to go with desktop to share. All right. I should have two tabs open, uh, one of which is our chapter. The other is going to be the running app. Um, so I'm going to pick up where we left off, Russ, at that section 12.8. Um, I finished populating the remaining part of this particular book or this uh, uh, chapter. So um, in the previous section, uh, we used a service called Message Handler to manage data from the server. Uh, in comparison, we also used a input handler to pre-process data from JavaScript. So uh, the two sections before this chapter eight was uh, R to JavaScript, so the R server passing information to JavaScript, and then from JavaScript passing back out to R. Um, and this relationship, uh, I was explaining to Arthur, think of it as a triangle. So we have what uh, our, our community would be familiar with, this shiny application of our uh, UI, the browser itself, and then the R server, where we're doing a lot of our processing at. By plugging in this JavaScript library, we are creating this uh, third player in the relationship of just the UI and the server. So now we're passing information to JavaScript, JavaScript is passing it back to R, R is sending from the server to the UI, rendering it, and then, yeah, you have this, this trifecta of uh, three applications running together. I'm not repeating myself. We've talked about this relationship in previous chapters as well, getting to this point. Starting with the uh, this section 12.8, uh, what we're doing is creating that relationship. So we we need to we need to kind of model or or figure out what these named variables are that we're passing between JavaScript and and the R server itself. Um, so we we use the term message handler and input handler respectfully. For this argument, we need, uh, sorry, for the first argument, we need three things. Uh, that's obviously information or data from JavaScript, um, the physical shiny session, and then the name of the input. That's supposed to be three bullet statements that didn't render properly. I didn't have a space between there. Um, but the data from the JavaScript library, the shiny session itself, so this would be from the UI and then also the name of the input that we're going to be manipulating. We can replace these three necessities with the three dot notation um, if required. So that's the dot, dot, dot notation. Um, John, our author, uh, is using a third package uh, in this particular uh, chapter of, of discussion, and it's the per package. So we're going to be uh, looping through information. And with that dot, dot, dot notation, we're passing those arguments from those previous functions. So with the per package, we have this uh, hand, by the way, when I when I show my example of running application and the uh, Shiny app itself, uh, just know I haven't implemented this chunk into uh, formally implemented it into the Shiny app. So uh, I'm still stuck at the section 12.7 where I left off at. Um, process results, and then we create a function passing it with the data and then the dot, dot, dot notation with those three other previous arguments. Um, using the per map uh, data frame, um, we're going to use that data and then as data frame uh, when, we, when we render it. What we're doing is um, setting up a more eloquent manner in which we're capturing that uh, user input, the uh, the selection of the image that we're we're processing, and then that relationship between JavaScript and the uh, R server end. 
we need to also register this function with Shiny. So we do that using the register input handler. What this is, is the ability to acknowledge from the UI's perspective that we have this input handler called, uh, it's, it's going to be labeled as ML5 class, and then it's going to be the process results. So as per is rendering all of this, um, we're going to be labeling or um, this is an R6 class, correct? Uh, the ML5 dot class, it, the notation that I'm referring to. Uh, there's a caution here that says the above call only runs once. So when you when you initiate this particular um, web socket between server and JavaScript back and forth, it only renders once. And so there's a method in which we could uh, force it to reset, but that's not uh, appropriate because it will ultimately uh, possibly have uh, adverse effects on other um, namespace package linkages. Uh, the above call only runs once. This is to ensure we don't overwrite other packages within the same user namespace. Uh, we can override this option with force true, but it is highly, highly do not please ever do this. Uh, it is very unadvisable. Um, what you will do is ultimately break other possible functions that you call on if you were to pass this force true. Yes, it gives you the option to run it. Uh, and, and if it's only the one option, this might be appropriate. But if you're going to be building a more dynamic shiny app, um, using force true is probably not appropriate. Once the handler is created, we only need to tell Shiny which input uh, should use the handler. This is accomplished through the add custom, custom message handler. Uh, we're going to uh, name it classify and then the function data that we had called earlier. Um, what I'm using here is going to be a replacement of our classifier.js library. So if you don't mind, I'm going to switch to R briefly and show you what that currently looks like without this uh, particular uh, section. Go back to R. If I go to classify JS, what we're doing is replacing this bottom section here of our classify.js call. We're creating that per package on the server side. As we pass that information to it, it will start to aggregate and then um, being able to uh, manage it from the UI's perspective. So let me go back here presentation. So what's different between these two, and I, I don't want to switch back and forth, but what's different between these is the classify, classifier classify, and then shiny input value classification ML5 class. This naming notation is what is different from the previous. Uh, we're adding this colon notation to it. Uh, now we can view the whole entire library script as a whole. Um, so we're instantiating the Shiny library in our namespace, uh, adding the resource path assets that's based on the document uh, or the uh, tree structure uh, of our, of our uh, running package. Um, we create the handler function data with dot, dot, dot uh, using that uh, mapping function per function uh, to uh, uh, iterate through uh, and create a data frame with that. Uh, we register the Shiny handler input as an ML5 class. Um, we pass the dependencies of the JavaScript itself. Um, we talked about this last week. Um, this is kind of pseudo, looks like a YAML file, but it, it ultimately uh, it's just pointing at where this particular library lives uh, in a CDN type network uh, at this particular destination. Um, Russ, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot briefly, um, we talked about minified versus unminified JavaScript. Uh, minifying just removes all white space and kind of reduces the overall size of the file. It makes it fairly difficult to uh, try to render or, or view it um, in this minified form. There are options to uh, unminify or put that white space back in, making it a little easier to interpret. In this example, though, we are using the minified version of this ML5 JavaScript library. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, we also create the, the uh, actual user uh, interface itself um, with passing that dependency to the ML5 library. Um, we are creating a tag list um, 
these are going to be the assets and then classify JS. So we're from the UI's perspective, we're accessing the JavaScript library call classify JS that we created earlier. The select input is selected bird, label is bird, and then choices will be flamingo and lorikeet. Um, I had promised Arthur earlier last week uh, when we were presenting that I would like to uh, attempt uh, different images. And so I went down a rabbit hole uh, with being able to do some web scraping, uh, go to a particular URL, uh, pass all the, uh, render all of the, the HTML tags using the HTML tools library, uh, and then scrape off images from that and then put them in this asset directory. Um, I did successfully render that web scraping, but I wasn't able to call any of these uh, various images in. I'll show you that comment here in a moment. Uh, we do create an action button, classify. Uh, we label it uh, as classify, press the button. Uh, the UI output is bird display and the table output is results. This could potentially be where my error is, and we'll see this here in a second. Uh, the server end of this, obviously, we have to complement all of our UI um, selection points and, and data output points. So we're creating an output bird display rendering the UI with path um, using this sprint F function. Um, anything in the assets directory uh, with a wildcard ending in JPEG, so .jpeg. Uh, inputs select bird, tags is image, source path, and then ID is bird. Um, just to reiterate, last week when I was covering the development from an RStudio perspective to the rendered HTML uh, document object model that we create, this tags function uh, is creating that image, HTML image tag, and then inside there we're passing the source to where those images are located and then labeling them as ID bird. Uh, observe event is input classify session is send custom message uh, for the classify with that list of selection. And then the output of the results is uh, as the ML5 library um, uses the mobile net to uh, classify uh, the accuracy of the image that we pass it. Okay. All right. That is section eight. And that was ultimately where I wanted to stop last week. Um, so I I just covered that that chapter eight. So anything past this point is all new. Okay. So um, could you go back to the code at the end of that? Uh, yes, sir. Section? So, um, so in I, if you look at the HTML created by Tiny for mm -hmm. for for the app that described here, yes, um, there there'll be some element in there with classification as its identifier I mm -hmm. believe and so the, the 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 point of this is like um um is you were trying to no 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 that's not true so you you are using ml5 to classify a particular picture it get you know it identifies the picture of the bird that is currently on screen correct classifies that the results of running that classification are are attached to an uh, an element called classification mm -hmm. that is within the shiny, the, the server side of shiny attached to the input list. Um, and the purpose of the, the, the ML5.class the, the, of, of registering that input handler is to kind of dictate to shiny how it manipulates the data obtained from ML that the, the, the sort of the, the classification results provided by ML5. I, so this is like a way of saying in R, process this data this particular way, and then you can subsequently use it for, for whatever reason you need. Well the way 
the way I'm interpreting, and, and this starts at the very beginning where we're talking about TensorFlow and, and the TensorFlow.js library, ML5 is a wrapper around TensorFlow.js. So what I uh, ultimately, the way I'm viewing this particular chapter or, or Shiny respectfully is just a templating or a management of that data. So the, the, the images that we're passing it uh, would be very common Shiny type input output uh, relationships. The selection of, of drop-down menu in what image we're, we're uh, uh, using, the actual action button or the radio button where we press it and execute the command. What is unique about this is because all of your machine learning calculations are done in ML5, or, or technically it's yeah. using the mobile net data set to compare the image to that mobile.net and then passing back the results of that calculation with accuracy. How accurate are we about that? And unfortunately, I'm gonna switch over to our browser real yeah. quick. Unfortunately, the fact that I'm getting a null value here tells me that everything about Shiny is operating properly. Somehow my relationship between server and JavaScript are, is broken. Um, I'm, I'm I'm managing the shiny side of being able to render the UI, have my drop down menu of selection, passing the image itself, and then this classify radio button. But it doesn't. Oh, hold on. Sorry. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna stop because this now works. <laughs> I don't know what magically happened. Maybe it was a timing thing. I don't know. Uh, let the let the rendering <laughs> purpose work. I don't think that's quite what they wanted it to look like, is it? Because no, it's the, not. the purpose of the handler was to convert these label confidence, label confidence into a single column of labels. That's correct. A single column of confidence in a data frame. That's correct. And yeah. you, what's basically happening is ML5 on the, um, the, the, the user's um, browser, Mm -hmm. is running some classification thing and it creates some a json of data that is passed into an r session running on the server somewhere that's and you have to tell r when you receive data of this type that is tagged with whatever particular metadata comes along with it from from um from the browser you have to tell it when you receive data of this type convert it into this type and then we'll be able that's to exactly it. right and then we'll know what to do with it and there's yeah there's something weird going on isn't there? well even even better yet and I'll, I'll add to this it puts the load of calculation or the load of processing this machine learning logic onto the user's computer not mm. onto the server itself and that, yeah. that's really the mind-blowing component of this. There's discussions at the beginning of the chapter where it was talking about the speed and efficiency of TensorFlow and the TensorFlow.js library, the ML5 wrapper, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, it's, it's using the computing processing capability of the user that is accessing this page, their resources to generate or render this, this ML5 relationship. Um, that's critical to the to the whole thought process and then to go back to your comment russ you are correct now it's being able to accept the results from that javascript calculation pass it into our server and then from the r servers and pass it back to the ui to give you the uh, uh, textual results that's a really good yeah. relation yes well and that's a that kind of triangle that trifecta kind of concept is we're adding this JavaScript plugin library to our, our familiar shiny relationship where we're passing information between the server. Well, the user selecting the server, passing it to the JavaScript library, the JavaScript library, passing it back to the server, and then the server handing it back over to the UI. Um, there's an image at the very beginning of this chapter where it kind of sets up the um, linkages between all of these points. Um, and, and it looks very busy, but when you really start to break down how the data passing from one function to another is, is managed, that actually starts to make sense. Um, what I wanted to have a, a laugh on though is 
this particular table in chapter eight, uh, 12.8 was intended to render a more plotly, not plotly, um, uh, a better form of a table on mm -hmm. its output. Um, and that's what I haven't, I haven't uh, set that, that classification. I haven't set that up yet. Uh, so we're getting some kind of ugly output. Uh, but what, what is important here is as the ML5 library or TensorFlow is looking at the mobile.net uh, mobile data set and then comparing the image we're passing it to the existing uh, library, um, there's a confidence level or, or a named convention that is passed back and forth. And that's um, starts out with these in quotation marks, jellyfish, um, mouse, computer mouse, and then finally it, it renders on Flamingo. And then it passes a confidence level of how accurate this is. And the use case that I was sharing with Arthur um, earlier, I'll try to find the link, is the, uh, the uh, relationship between a chihuahua, uh, a, a, a canine dog chihuahua versus a chocolate chip cookie, or maybe it's a, a muffin, chocolate chip muffin. Anyway, computer logic has a difficult time in differentiating between the facial the face of a chihuahua versus the chocolate chip cookie and the confidence level or the accuracy of how how uh, good it is in in making that assessment um, is actually really poor uh, and they're they're working on that uh, that's that's one of the uh, training models that we're using to to develop to make our our confidence interval higher uh, if I change this to the lower key real quick, and what you'll see it render is now I get this different labeled output. So uh, it's bee eater, um, dragonfly, darning needle, devil's needle, uh, darning needle, sewing needle, snake feeder, snake doctor, mosquito hawk, skeeter hawk. Uh, all of these named variables are from that mobile net data set. So as the... Yeah. As the, as the model is rendering, this machine learning model is re, uh, rendering, it's getting closer and closer to the accuracy of what it is until it gets to a point where it labels it as lower key and then passes a confidence level of how accurate that would be. So it's, that lower key is five times less likely to be a lower key than it is right. a sewing needle. Correct. Correct. Okay. Okay. And well, the comment I was making to Arthur last week was I, I wanted to execute alternate images than just these two uh, to see what other options I could I could get it to trigger um, the confidence level of accuracy yeah, that yeah. I could get it to generate. Um, unfortunately, I didn't I didn't do that. Let's go I, back. I, to I saw you in the in the talk last week. You were you were describing how kind of. Um, it, for the developer to be downloading these figures one by one and storing them inside the um, app that you're building, in, in, you know, in the, the source code mm -hmm. repository for the app is kind of bad practice. And what sh should probably, what would, you know, if there was more than two images involved, a, a better idea would be to, you know, maybe have a vector of those images at Wikipedia Correct. that you're interested in. and obtain them on the fly from wikipedia we were thinking like api calls or yeah. uh, and, and api is a different subject with relation to our logic here but um, it would make it more efficient for the server in in relation to another data set another library of images uh, to uh, allow the user to select you know an image at fly and then process it go from there the api call is one option um, if we had a loaded library, local loaded library, and then being able to access it. But that usually becomes a potential security vulnerability there okay. uh, where your browser is accessing your local file structure. Um, that's usually not a, an appropriate method. So the, the nature of how this could be uh, augmented or made better, uh, we get a little bit further down into the into the packaging process uh, because the packaging allows uh, a, a more secure method to access local space uh, for the user to upload a file and then okay. process it based on the, the uh, mobile net 
data set. I wanted to just quickly show this web scraping. So I'm not, I didn't do this uh, by myself. I, I, I'm Google searching and trying to find things that worked. Uh, I did find one and this is me just looking at a particular uh, message thread or a, or a blog post um, from, a, from a community, uh, but it was <clears throat> talking about different animals and the whole blog post concept was people posting animals in their message thread. So I knew that there would be rendered objects, whether it be Bitbucket or some other access point where we're, we're accessing these images. What I was doing is scraping that blog post, looking for those image source references, you know, image source equals, and then some other user space, being able to multi-thread out from that point, grab that image, and then download it local to my machine. Um, what I ended up doing was uh, this script runs uh, about 70 images, uh, but that's only because it's from the blog post itself. Uh, and again, web scraping as a topic is a completely different scenario altogether. Um, it's it's one of the tool belt options that the data analyst or the data science person has at their disposal. Um, not all data is in a clean form for us to just access with an API and call it in. We have to actually render it sometimes. Um, at any rate, going back to the presentation where we're packaging it, um, Russ, I thought this was a, a really excellent use case of our past book club conversations, uh, the packaging process as, as a whole. Moving on to chapter 12.9, um, I made my own personal quote here. This is me. I said, when I write scripts, I feel like I'm making a collage of magazine snip, uh, clippings, right? I remember being in grade school and, you know, they wanted us to make this art project and we had to, you know, snip out a bunch of images and paste them on, you know, this collage representing some um, feeling or, or, or some level of, of conveying information to another user. And what I laughed about was my scripting methodology is a lot of me Googling things and trying to figure out help documents and, you know, plugging in function calls that don't work. And I have to kind of figure out debugging why, you know, my, my reference isn't working. What you end up getting is this really kind of ugly Frankenstein script. And we've talked about that before, uh, where you're you're mixing and matching, you know, the tidyverse method of piping versus the base R passing functions, and it kind of gets really ugly. If it works, then we can we can manage it after that. So I said nothing quite fits together, but as a whole, the script runs. Um, this is a personal quote I made uh, to a friend regarding my my uh, inept or naive scripting ability. <laughs> For the majority, writing scripts can be difficult. Um, yet, as a common rule, if you can pseudo code your intent, write it out, figure out exactly what you want to do with your with your uh, uh, app, um, and then author it in a language of your choice. In this case, for our book club, it's in R, and then make it operate. You're 20 steps ahead of your peers. That's my own opinion. My point is that if you can get a script that operates, then we can go optimize it at a later point. Maybe this library call that I'm making or this function call isn't optimal. We can change it, use different storage classifications, et cetera, and, and pass variables back and forth a little more eloquently than your hard-coded, um, ugly script. And that's... Yeah drives I, at the function like of packaging. That if, if you can find someone who's already written the package. Today, well, there you go, right. 200 steps ahead of you. <laughs> Good point, sir. Good point. Uh, refactoring and optimizing code are always traits you want to follow, yet you have to have a working script to optimize, right? In the next section, the author discusses packaging your ML5.js shiny app for reuse by others. Uh, the first line of code we implement in our new package is uh, packaged mindset is the use this function. So we use this create package ML5. Um, Arthur, you've uh, used this quite often in your presentations. Um, I have not done this. So just know from this point forward, I don't have any active code to, uh, to render uh, what I'm showing you here. But as a relation to the create package, what that does is uh, automatically create a tree, uh, a, a, a directory tree of where to put some of these scripts. 
and that's going to come into play with this next topic. Um, we used similar use this actions in the past. Additionally, for more deep dives into the use this package, um, I would encourage all users or all readers uh, to go check out the new second edition R packages, uh, specifically chapter six, the package within. Throughout this section or this chapter six of the of the R packages book, um, both Jenny Bryan. Hadley Wickham and the other authors that are creating this, this book, um, they have made a very substantial change in the table of contents of that document. Um, so I wanted to go make sure that I was pulling out the right version. Uh, note the, the R packages second edition is currently under construction. The table of contents is drastically changed from the first edition. Um, if you are going to use or access the first edition, you probably will be okay. Uh, it's not until the later half of the book where things really start to go. Um, future proofing. Um, I'm specifically looking at chapters 19 and 21 of that book. I gave that presentation and it was uh, pretty much five or six ideas on the page. And then I had to create everything on my own. Um, that's not a negative comment towards the, the authors. They just haven't populated it yet. Um, what does the above code do? Answer, it creates a package-esque space for all advantages of package development. Um, as a relation between our JavaScript book club and the R Packages book club, um, most of all the packaging is going to be outside of this conversation. Um, we're only pulling in those details specific to the, the necessity of building a JavaScript oriented package. In our previous Shiny App example, we were given two options to incorporate JavaScript. The first one was using a CDN or content delivery network. Uh, the second would be accessing your, your JavaScript library local to your machine. Now, both options have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, for example, if we want to use the CDN, uh, it's extremely fast, it's extremely efficient, and, and there was a notation that said that the CDN servers are actually geographically located uh, throughout uh, the world to extremely efficiently download JavaScript libraries uh, during runtime of your document object model. Um, when I say efficient, we're talking microseconds, nanoseconds of processing time. Um, if we didn't have an internet access though, and we still wanted to render our library, then we would require the download and storage of that uh, package or, 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 or JavaScript library local to your machine. And so what the, what the author is doing here is giving us a if else statement of selection. If we have an internet access and we have the ability of getting out to the world, let's use the CDN because it's fast and efficient. If we realize we don't have an internet connection, we aren't able to access the CDN, then we will just uh, go to our, our local file structure and see if we can, we can locate it there. Uh, the author states when developing packages provides options for both techniques. CDNs are amazingly fast and efficient. Uh, an alternative would be to encapsulate your package, your JavaScript, uh, or package your JavaScript library into your R package, um, and then host it on local storage. Where CDNs are super fast and local storage provides access without internet, the package developer should provide both options. So this next snippet is giving us that uh, opportunity. We're creating a, a uh, inst directory, and if you if you do use the use this package call, we want to put that script in the inst directory. So we're creating a folder or directory, putting our JavaScript library in there. Uh, we're downloading it from a particular URI. Uh, in this case, it's the ML5 library version 0.4.3, and then we're going to download it and put it into that inst, labeling it as ML5 min, min JS. Um, we can also create that classify JS. So previously in my current directory, if I could go back to R briefly, I don't mean to jump around back and forth here. In the previous sections 12.0 through 12.8, uh, we were putting our classify.js in the assets uh, tree. When we create this packaging function though, we want to put this classify JS in that uh, instantiation or inst directory instead. So we would have to modify or move some of these uh, tools. Back to presentation. The next step will import our classify.js script as well as create the ML5 HTML dependency uh, objects. So in this case, and I, 
I do need to ask a question to both of you. Um, when I'm capturing these from the book, I wasn't familiar with this notation, and I I wasn't sure if it was a a uh, uh, roxygen call or not. Um, I went ahead yes. and it is roxygen. At least for the second line, the add, uh, add export. Yeah, it, it, it exactly. exports it to the namespace for the function. Good point. Good point. Um, I didn't know if that was the uh, uh, book down, package down, book down form that we were rendering the J, uh, JavaScript library uh, as a code snippet, if it was intended to be there or not, um, or if it was something that came in during that rendering process. I went ahead and left it in there just in case. Um, yeah, we are no, creating think, an op. Sorry, Go I, I, think, I mean, I think the first line's there just to indicate where in your package tree this code should sit, which good point specific file it should sit in. The, the second line's a, a Roxygen syntax. Good. Uh, yeah. So we're 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 creating a, a, a named object use ML5 uh, with the CDN true. Um, the package placement or or calling the HTML2's dependency is listing out uh, what version to to uh, use. One note that I had while I was looking at this. I'm not, I'm, 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 this is, this HTML dependencies labeling as 1.0.0. Is this pointing at our local storage of the ML5 library and we're putting a version label of it as 1.0.0? And I, I'm, I'm only asking this question because maybe it's the classify JS that we're labeling as 1.0.0. I want to be careful that I'm not messing up this version number versus the ML5 library version number that we're accessing. No, I think that's definitely that that will solely refer to the the bespoke bit of JavaScript that you're writing to okay. link your the ML5 library with your shiny app that you you generate okay. here. So it, it is the classified JS that we're labeling yeah, as one dot zero dot zero. Okay, yeah. good, good. Um, the next is the if else statement, depending on if we're using a CDN network or if we're accessing it in a local storage form. Um, if we if we do have CDN as an option, uh, we will go out and download the min uh, ML5 min JS from uh, the, uh, the, the HTML reference uh, library, CDN library. Um, if that doesn't work, then we'll switch to an alternative where we're pointing back at our own uh, local storage of the min.js library. So we're giving two options here. During runtime, either access it local to our, our uh, service from the, the, our server, passing it into our document object model, the, the UI itself, or we're passing the head variable of our HTML file and then sourcing it from a, from a destination, CDN destination. Um, if I can go back briefly and just clarify what I'm referring to in that case, uh, for those that may not be as HTML friendly. What we're looking at inside the head of your HTML file is often the place where you put a lot of these script references. Um, it is appropriate and you can do it. I, I don't technically recommend that you do. Um, it makes your code a little hard to read, but um, you can create script blocks inside your body of your HTML file, uh, but those are to be used with caution, it's more appropriate to place most of your um, document object references, external references in the head of your HTML file. And so what I'm wanting to highlight is my last line here. Um, in the earlier running server case, um, I'm actually passing in my classify JS from my asset library. Um, so by rendering this example that we're showing here with this FL statement, is going to be creating a path for, where did that go? So towards the top. Sorry, there it is. Here, we're passing these HTML dependencies and then there's our ML5 uh, point that we're, we're putting in. Um, in essence, I guess if I, if I can just clarify what I'm referring to here, if we use this earlier call up here, we would actually create this uh, uh, script reference with the URL path, and then the doc document object model would, would access it 
and pull it down uh, to render locally. I'm not confusing with I'm discussing the topics here are, am I? The, the document object model rendering component of this accessing the CDN. Okay. Uh, I said note if else logic at the end of the script, this provides our two options, CDN and local storage. Go ahead, Russ. No, I think that was, uh, I mean, I think that, I think that makes made sense. Yeah, um, I um, I don't think you were confusing the how, how the the DOM will access those scripts. No? Correct. Um, cool. This next trigger classification earlier in the in the previous sections scripts, uh, we were creating a, a static ID value. Um, we're going to 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 change that to more of a dynamic application. And it's really to complement the packaging service uh, because we don't know the user that will be rendering our package. We're not familiar with their current setup. So by making it in a more dynamic form, it's allowing the computer to process uh, and, and, and uh, instantiate is not the right word I want to make. Uh, it's, it's being able to establish all of its calls uh, without us as the package developer knowing what their, their current infrastructure looks like. They may be using different browsers. They may be using different operating systems, et cetera. So in this case, by making the ID call more dynamic, um, it, it, it allows other users to have the same output of, of what our development environment would look like. The next step we must follow is to allow the user to place images anywhere on their computer, but how do we do that in our Shiny uh, app to access the altered space? Um, we can use the get default reactive domain. Um, I wanted to have just a brief, brief topic on the NS function call within Shiny. So in, in other book clubs, we've talked about the namespace call, um, being able to tell Shiny exactly where I can access memory allocation. Um, I was curious to find out, and I've never used this Git reactive domain call before, but is this an alternative to a direct NS path? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's okay. I, it's a rhetorical question to myself. I, I don't have a direct answer, but I have reason to believe that this is a more dynamic method to manage that uh, uh, path variable of where memory is located. Um, Arthur, if you don't mind me asking, in, in past experience, do you know the reference I'm making to the NS call, the namespace call? OK. So by getting the default reactive domain, I have reason to believe it's it's like just plugging into the entire namespace itself and saying anything that's in here, uh, you have access to concept instead of a, a direct naming path. Uh, well, Russ, have you have you worked with that uh, shiny function before? I've I've never worked with the norm. I'm aware of it. I feel like it's just like getting the current session, the session in which this yeah, is being I, used. But yeah, uh, I, I I rarely have to play with the session argument anyway. Um, so no, I've ne I've never worked with get default reactive domain and i'm currently reading the docs to find out what it actually does well but, um, yeah uh i should no, i, I should. don't know what that is i'm afraid um it seems to be some way of like specifying um uh, you know um i don't know i mean i i don't want to say the wrong thing and it get recorded <laughs> no exactly right <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll I'll be more than happy to be naive in in making my my uh, adjustments here or or assessments here. In earlier chapters, Arthur and I, or other book clubs, Arthur and I have I've spawned kind of a, a topic of of conversation about the V8 engine and Chromium uh, Node.js as a management of memory. And yeah. Arthur, if, I hope you you know the reference I'm making. I think it was in our advanced art book club, but um, what I started reading about or going way down the rabbit hole about is the V8 engine as a whole and its garbage collection and its, its heap stack and, and memory stack allocation um, and how JavaScript or, or how the C++ library manages all of that memory. 
I believe what's happening here with this get default reactive domain. It could be completely naive with my comment, but I believe what it's doing is pointing at that particular heap stack saying your memory that you're looking for, the variables that we are creating, the named objects we're creating stored in this location is going to be accessible to our, our document object model. I think that's the intent. I'm, I'm not so sure, to be honest. Not sure. Okay. I, um, I, I, I think this is something that's happened. It, it, I don't think that the, the DOM is relevant here. I no, think okay. what this is, um, is it relates to um, uh, presumably in, in Mastering Shiny, you'll have done, um, you know, the, the reactive graph and, and things That's like correct. that. That's correct. So yeah. the, the objects that are um, kind of active within the reactive graph, um, some of them are inputs, some of them are outputs, and, but, but a lot of the intervening things are kind of reactive objects that are... Um, um uh what would the word be like intermediate uh, type yeah yeah storage, they're intermediate right? and they may you know they may be randomly created and destroyed and things like that and what you're what you're what i think the reactive domain is is it kind of uh defines all the reactive objects that are in play in okay. the shiny session at a given time that makes sense um but I might be completely wrong. Um, I'm not worried about being wrong, even if it is preserved sure. for posterity, because it's difficult stuff and you can't know it. It is. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I think it is. I think it's definitely something in the back end, and I think it's definitely something related to the reactive objects that are in play. It's the first time I've I've witnessed that function call. I, I, I can assure you of the, all of that reading. That's the first time I've ever witnessed an author making reference to that activity. Um, in the JavaScript code, in the, in the classifier JS file that we are creating, uh, we want to kind of change the management of how we're referencing these IDs. So a key difference in our previous example was we were using a document get element by ID, and then we were labeling it as birds. Um, and I, I can show you that real quick over here. And if I go to classify, Get document, uh, get document, get element ID, and then labeling it as bird. Um, we want to change how that function works because if the user is using a different use case of our ML5 Shiny app package that we're developing, it, it may not be birds. So what we want to do is modify that. And so the, what we're going to end up doing is get element ID and then passing it as data instead. So we don't know what the information you're you're wanting to render here. We're just going to allow a space for you to populate and allow the rest of our functions to operate. Uh, the key here is data will be passed from the R server. Second, we use an input classification to hard code the ID. We'll change this ability to be more dynamic. We achieve this by concatenating two strings together with the ID plus and then underscore classification. Note the JavaScript concatenation will be using the plus symbol. However, in R, we use the paste zero uh, function instead to concatenate two strings. Okay. So again, this is our, our same classifier JS file that we created earlier in the document. Um, we're going to be modifying it now to pass in this classification ML5 class. Uh, I know, it still says bird. What am I missing? No, it's the same. It's the same in the book. I think it's a typo in the book as well. Uh, think, yeah, because this should be this should be referencing the the point up here, correct? Uh, excuse me. This ID plus classification, right, is what we should be passing into there, or data, I guess. Okay. All right, and then input handler. Uh, the author comments about the JavaScript passing to R and creating a data frame can only be in initiated once. Uh, putting the code in the R file will only work once. I have reason to believe, I don't know this for a fact, but I believe this has to do with our web socketing technology that we're, we're using between Shiny and JavaScript. The fact that we can only create it once, we have to find a way that when we reactively change the, the data that we're passing into the function, we've got to be able to reset that and, and, and process or accept that change in, in data. So the 
the change that we're doing the same per function of with dot 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 notation uh, this will uh, the the comment says it'll it'll create an error um, so the code this code won't work um, if we just call library ml5 um, it'll say it loads once but then if we call it again it'll give us an error saying uh, yeah you will, that already exists you can't you can't recreate that um, as an extension to this topic of only being able to load once, um, the author was citing chapter 11.5.2 of the R packages book, uh, and specifically it's a bulleted statement. Um, loading, sorry, loading will load code, data, and all DLLs, registering S3 and S4 methods, and run the on load function. After loading, the package is available in memory, but because it's not in the search path, you won't be able to access its components without using the colon colon notation. Confusingly, the double colon will also load a package automatically if it isn't already loaded. It's rare to load package explicitly, but you can do this with a required namespace or load namespace function. Um, this topic or this reference that they're making to chapter 11, um, I know in the book it was talking a lot about being able to manage a user's computer. So you want to be careful that you're not completely changing their architecture when you, you load your package. There's a, there's a, a demilitarized zone or an area where uh, it's, it's almost taboo to manipulate somebody else's computer. Uh, and a good example use case of that is Jenny Bryan's and I will burn your computer down reference, um, her Twitter post that she made about the uh, here, here uh, reference. In essence, we need to provide the R server a means to reset itself when a new image is requested or when the user activates the reactive call to process or analyze a new image. When we press our activity button of classification, the user space of relationship between JavaScript and R Studio and the, and the UI itself, that reactive call of reset, uh, we don't want to completely reiterate everything over again. So we're only wanting to focus on those cached memory points that are changing, those reactive calls that are changing. Um, I may not be doing this particular section justice. Uh, if we need more information about this topic, I encourage you to go read that chapter 11 uh, reference in, in, in management of our namespace or search path. Okay. Uh, the final section of this chapter is the testing paragraph. Um, here, ultimately, um, I made some references to past book clubs regarding testing packages. Um, it is implied as a good method to test your package or to load your package often uh, while in development to see if there's anything that's going to break. Um, in the majority of our book clubs, testing is key, especially, and I put that in bold italics highlighted, with package development. Therefore, testing is advisable at every step of the development and authoring process. So here is our full running Java, sorry, this is our full running library. Uh, we're calling on the DT library, uh, the ML5 library and the Shiny library. Now ML5 is something that we're creating as this package, which references all the way to the very be beginning of chapter 12.9. Uh, add resource path assets, uh, UI doesn't change other than we're adding this use ML5 uh, function call. Um, we also call the DT output as results. Uh, there's another change that we made. Uh, we can see this underscore classification notation that we were making okay. previous. Go ahead, Russ. Sorry. Can I can I just double check? Right. So what we've done here is we've we've created a package that contains the kind of the code for running ML five in in you know on on some users' brow browser. That's and correct. Here we're writing a separate shiny app in a separate place, a, a separate repository that imports that ML5 package. And, and we're showing how to make the, um, the, the, the kind of ML5 package that we've written, make the code in there usable by yes. anyone who might want to use it, right? A good, yeah, good comment. And, and maybe I should change this to say that it could be, you know, Rust hide package, and that could be the, the library call that we make that has all the tools and resources that we've authored as a package for access in our new Shiny app. Maybe that'll make more sense. 
Um, in short, this last script uh, as a whole, again, I haven't rendered this. Um, one of the things that I want to be careful about um, that I don't falsely portray the last section of this packaging concept. Um, I have never written a formal package before. Arthur, I know you've had experience with it, and I know, Russ, you've been a maintainer on packages. Um, by creating a package and then managing it, it's all about the dev tools uh, load all. So as we create and as we test this, um, you can use a huge quantity of test that and, and uh, use this functions, dev tools functions uh, to manage all of that. I technically use this as part of the dev tools library, but at any rate, by running dev tools load all, it is bringing in all of your libraries into your namespace, just as if we were uh, downloading it from a, a mirror someplace. Um, I'm going to pause there because I, I, I know that I'm definitely on the junior end of this topic with, uh, with other package developers. Um, you're probably more familiar and have a better way of, of talking about that load all concept. Oh, oh sorry, go ahead, Russ. So yeah, I'm 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 looking at the the the, the source code in the book and, and wondering whether this is being written as a the, the the shiny app here is being written as a kind of standalone shiny app that is put in you know it, it, it put within that package in the same way that you might put a vignette in a package or a right. um, um, something like that, so that it's a way whereby. Um, a user of the ML5 code can see how it's used in action rather than a, a, as a kind of standalone, you know, a separate shiny app that's being right. developed for, for the purposes of being a kind of, you know, production shiny app or something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to work out where we are in the kind of context of the code. Yeah, I was, I was kind of confused. Oh, yeah, sorry. I was kind of confused by this as well, Russ. I, I, I think your idea is is, uh, is 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 a really good one. But I, I was kind of wondering to myself, like how I sort of feel like um, it might have been useful to have had perhaps another chapter somewhere about maybe um, how to test these types of packages. Um, I mean, maybe that's a bit too narrow and esoteric, but I, I mean, for example, like this, this function, um, let's see, um, like create, creating a, creating a, an input handler. Like how, how do I, how do I think about writing a test for that? I mean, it seems like it's in, in a certain sense, like it's a function that has a side effect, but a side effect in a particular context. And I, I don't know how to go about I don't know how to go about testing that. I mean, I guess I'll have to look at some of John's packages uh, to, to, for, for some guidance, but I mean, it seems like there's maybe a little missing piece on the, on the, on the, on the testing side. Maybe, maybe John's got another book in the works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is quite difficult though, because I imagine if, if, you're, if you're developing tools that will subsequently be used by shiny developers, do do you then have to in in order to test your tools do you have to kind of embed within the package where you develop them uh kind of um a, a bunch of small shiny apps or something that can then be tested using shiny test or something like that it seems a very kind of um it seems very over the top way of doing it to to get a kind of end-to-end -end test of what these well, a couple of things and things are actually doing. But. A couple of things that come to mind initially, just talking about web development in general. Russ, there was a, a there was a reference that uh, Colin Fay made about it was a Canon or it had something to do with with loading this um, you know huge ballistic uh, uh, load on a web server, uh, like like it would just almost kind of uh, uh, multi-thread uh, make calls uh, almost like a uh, that called a denial of service yeah, type yeah. Uh, function call, and then your 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 
you're testing your loading uh, uh, the the space yeah. in which yeah. it's rendering and and so if, i don't know if it would be a bunch of library or shiny app calls necessarily or shi shiny apps necessarily uh, but it would be structuring it in a manner to i don't know change your library of what you're confidence testing and i know i'm being specific to this ml5 subject here yeah. but yeah. like you know being able to iterate through multiple images and then just passing it in uh, arthur to your comment regarding the validation of javascript stored memory right so um is there a way that you could write you know console log type calls uh that would say you know yes it's loaded yes it's installed yes you know i've, I've got this memory here and, and this is the image that i'm using concept like is that a way that you could test assurance that the JavaScript end of our library is working as well, or the relationship between our server and JavaScript is working. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if that would be something you have to do. Uh, I, mean, I mean, in a sense, this is probably not the right term, but um, let's say if you're you're you're, you're writing, um, you know, you're writing a, a package that wraps an API, you know, one strategy might be to kind of um, uh, do some like web mocking or, or something of that nature and then kind of see, see the, see the, see how your, your, um, your functions react to kind of mock, uh, mock requests, uh, or sorry, not mock requests, but mock return values from the from API endpoint. I, I mean, I'm wondering if, you'd have to do something here, like just as Russ was saying, you'd have to create a shiny app that makes a call to your function and then somehow inspect the shiny, either inspect the shiny app as like a, as a web page, or I guess you could kind of you know, parse the DOM and see if the thing that you're endeavoring to create is present in the page or and or utilize kind of the shiny testing tools to see how Actually, I don't even know what the shiny testing tools are, are, are there, but I don't know. I mean, so to me, it's just like, for example, if you're creating a handler, I, there must be a way of inspecting the page to see if the handler is, 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 is present somehow. Uh, but I, I guess that would be the approach you'd have to have to take uh, with this, uh, you know, create some shiny app and then yeah. run it somehow. I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm not I, sure how if you could have like a yeah, session I'm, of shiny. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. That it, it would certainly be possible to do it in a, a headless shiny thing. I was wondering at what stage it actually gets converted, because presumably if um, um, there is the, um, what's it called, um, test server thing available in shiny, which um, can... It, it, do a, a kind of model of the reactive behavior on the server side of your app and if if the input handler modifies your um modifies your code at the point at which you try to access a input dollar input dollar bird classification or whatever it is in your your your, your session um, if that happens at the point at which you access the data in in the server then it probably could be tested there um, in a much more lightweight way than having to spin up a whole app and do kind of end-to-end -end front end type testing stuff um, yeah, I've no idea. I've no idea what happens. Um, presumably, um, there's a, a a handshake prior to the server function. Uh, well, the, the the kind of reactive graph updating and things, where data that has been obtained from the from javascript is con is converted into our appropriate objects but whether that happens like um 
whether that happens when the the you know the code that i write is is evaluated or whether that happens kind of immediately and the the input objects are ready for me to use in my code i don't i don't really don't know to be honest it's quite quite interesting and never really thought about it um I mean, I wonder, I wonder, uh, Russ, if like the JavaScripts, you know, JavaScript is basically kind of like an input, uh, you know, we're setting it as an input. And I wonder if that appears in the reactive log for, for, for Shiny. I, I mean, if so, if so, maybe that might be a way to see that it exists and, you know, maybe I guess test on that basis. I, I, I'm pretty weak on the whole Shiny testing ecosystem i know there are tools out there but i'm not really fully aware of what what it does i'm still at the stage of click and see what happens <laughs> yeah um <laughs> Mon monkey testing, I, I, is that what it's called i'm not sure uh, hold on uh, where were we the, this here is my plans for my book on um shiny testing and our testing awesome. ecosystem unfortunately <laughs> unfortunately it's n never gonna happen because we don't have the time <laughs> but um yes I, I know i know a little bit about the ecosystem but uh and and i'm somewhat of an enthusiast but this evades my uh knowledge um but yeah uh <laughs> I, mean, I wonder if there are other like testing tools that are kind of like closer to the metal, if I could put it that way. I mean, you know, in a sense, like the, the Shiny app is nothing more than a web page. So presumably mm -hmm. tools kind of proper web developers might use. Maybe some of them would be relevant in this case to test how, mm -hmm. to, you know, if so, how to integrate them into kind of the, the R test that ecosystem. I have, I have, I have, yeah. no, I have no idea. Well, there, there is a tool called, um, there's a, a tool called shiny test and a newer iteration of it called shiny test 2 um which is a kind of halfway house between the um uh the the javascript tools like cypress and puppeteer which which kind of um web developers use for doing you know um for mocking how a user would interact with a web page and then you know waiting for appropriate changes on the web page and then checking that the, the, uh, you know what was expected there's lots of tools like that in the javascript uh, ecosystem and, and equivalent ones using like web driver in python and, and various other languages shiny test um is a kind of halfway house where it's it's more tailored towards shiny you can still do things like um tell it to tell a particular instance to click on the classify button select this bird from the drop down and then wait for whatever to update and check that the values but what shiny test can do is it can actually reach into the shiny uh, the, the 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 kind of objects stored in um, the the server side of a shiny app, and you know pull out our versions of those data structures for you to use in test that type assertions. Um, so it means that you don't necessarily have to learn um, quite so much JavaScript as you would in order to use Cypress and Puppeteer and things um and play right and that um but you still have to learn the kind of um um the kind of a asynchronous approach to programming and you know initiating some action and then waiting until it's performed and, and things like that but um yeah but I have no idea where all this goes on. So, you know, it may be reaching in and getting stuff out of the shiny server after the input handlers have done their, um, uh, what it is that they do. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. it's quite interesting though. Um, yeah.
Um, so, um, so now by this point in the chapter, we've got a package that contains um, a kind of abstraction of what you'd need to run a classification of, of an image using ML5 and um, a, a way of defining the input handlers and output handlers or whatever else there is that are necessary to take data from the browser, convert it into appropriate R data structures, and then manipulate that and send them back to, to and uh, you know, kind of separately, whether in the package or in a kind of separate repo, you've set up a shiny app that um, just demonstrates that that code works works well and stuff. Um, so yeah, it's it's quite a neat way of approaching the um, the thing, uh, the the you know of of demonstrating how your code works. Um, yeah. That's cool, that's cool. Um, um, I, had a, I had a challenge at work recently where like, um, we were making an HTML widget type thing. And the, the problem I had with it was, it, it's quite easy to do like unit testing that the thing works, you know, that appropriate um entries are being added to an r object but with that i still didn't feel like real i could really demonstrate that the html widget was creating the object that it it's supposed to when you um create the a web page that contains that widget you know so it's easy to set up the data structures in r and test the contents of them, but to provide a, a kind of guarantee of the, uh, the you know, the the a, a typical use case for that widget was a bit harder to kind of demonstrate in the thing. So all I've had to do is just like write a vignette and hope that it will. Um, the hope that the vignette won't regress. So what I'm quite interested in is whether um, the, the the testing tools like Shiny Test and things like that may be able to um, make assertions on just a general HTML page um, because that would be a way of without having to step outside of R a way of testing end-to-end -end that an, uh, a kind of front-end widget works from an R perspective. It is dangerous though, because it means that you're like, t you're, you're testing someone else, you know, it might be a third party um, JavaScript library that you're trying to test, but there's no real reason for you to test it. But I guess, you know, when you're having to write JavaScript linker code um, to take data from R, pass it to that library, it still seems valid to, to want to be able to demonstrate that you get the points where you expect them to be, you don't get um, a kind of blank page or something like that. Um, but yeah, so it's quite, it's quite challenging. Um, so kind of. I think Shiny Test 2 does it, if I'm not mistaken, Russ. I think it basically takes a snapshot of a page, but it's uh, uh, I think it's quite sensitive to, you have to be careful about the resolution uh, or the kind of like the screen, screen size because it's looking for like pixel perfect fidelity. Mm. Um, so I think you can do that on like how it looks, but I mean, to your point about whether whether you find the element that you expect in the DOM that's that's I don't know if there's any well yeah. I don't know much about this space but I don't know if there's anything that kind of scratches that that itch because like you say you know at, at, at a minimum you know uh, you know you you if, if you have a if you have an HTML widget that's in a page you would want to see it in the page in the way in which you expect it right you know how it should should appear in the page and the, yeah 
ideally, I guess, we, like if you're passing data to it, a known, a known data set, right? You're just like a mock data set, then you should know the form, like everything about the element you should know since you're, you know, it's a standard, standard element that you're putting in, you're injecting into the page kind of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, sorry, I, I probably spoke for about 20 minutes over <laughs> what I expected to, but um, uh, yeah, we should probably wrap it up. I know that it's a pretty long session, Matt. Um, thanks, Ryan. I didn't, I didn't expect the second half of a chapter to cover quite so, so much. This was, time, a, this was yeah. an extensive chapter, yeah, mm. definitely. Yeah, yeah, that's cool, though. Um, yeah, thanks for doing that. I know it's two weeks in a row for you, but uh, it's uh, yeah, that was it was really interesting. It was quite, you hit this point in the books where there's loads where your knowledge of R and your knowledge of the kind of ancillary um, technology starts to fall apart, and uh, you know, like on the cusp of yeah. Um, I was, I was well, I was uh, while you were discussing the the uh previous topics i i i'm thinking in the back of my mind like so there's there's a there's a distinct difference between a full uh a front-end developer a back-end developer and then this full stack developer right and I, i'm i'm seeing that the topic of r studio the topic of shiny as a web development access to the world of r and then being able to render it, it, it it's it's this weird i don't know relationship of almost like I'm opening up a new world of, oh, wow, this is this is a whole area that I don't even know much about. And I'm coming from the other direction. I'm, I'm very comfortable in the space of, of the, uh, the front end or back end development and then looking at how I can achieve the same activity in R. The relationship I want to try and express to, to users that may be entering the field of Shiny and, and extending it into web development as a whole, I would really honestly pressure or look into the full stack development mindset. And what that is doing is it's, it's, it's Python, it's Node.js, it's database management, SQL, it's, it's PHP code and, you know, being able to, to, to interpret it. Um, I haven't bridged into mobility yet. I don't know much about that arena, but um, it, 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 dynamic, dynamic use of HTML5 is, is, is fairly uh, easy to, to comprehend, uh, scalable. In short, being in a analytic mindset, statistical mindset, using R as a, as a, as a tool, right. In this shiny library, um, package that we're, we're, we're having the book club about, and then plugging in JavaScript into the mass, um, it definitely widens a person's perspective. And, and I would only caution that it is overwhelming and just don't worry about it. That's normal to a human psychology. Um, it, it will eventually saturate and your maturity will grow extens extensively larger uh, by by not having a freak out session. So there is a lot going on here. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, thanks, guys. Um, next week, Lucio has offered to do another talk. Um, he was saying that he, he, he won't be able to attend many of the other sessions because he's got lectures that hit in at the same time um but he'll he'll be able to do next week's one which is on it's called tips and tricks i've not read it yet but it it, it looks quite a nice little chapter of kind of small nuggets of, of of gold um anyway we will meet next week for that um and thanks ever so much ryan for for your two talks on uh, chapter 12 it was great I shall see you all next week. Bye-bye. Thanks, team. See, see ya.